Hi, everyone, and welcome again to my audiovisual channel. My name is Gabriella Handel. I'm a draftsman and the host of the show, A Conversation About Art. During each episode, I look for the meaning of art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different artistic fields. Today, I offer you episode 71, and I will talk with artist Ned Bittinger. Bittinger? I don't really know how to pronounce it. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by liking and sharing this video and also by subscribing to my audiovisual channel. These are all immediate and at no additional cost to you. If you'd like to show your support with money, it's also very welcome and appreciated. You can do so by purchasing my drawings directly from my website, which is gabriellahandle.com, just one word. You can purchase crafts I make from eBay by prints of my drawing or leaving me a tip. Thank you for your time and attention, and in watching this episode, all of the links I just said will be in the description or caption, whatever it's called, and do leave a comment so I know you were here. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, Ned Bittinger, you are episode 71 of A Conversation About Art. Thank you very much for agreeing to talk to me today. Please tell our future listeners and viewers who you are and what you do. Well, greetings. My name is Ned, Ned Bittinger, and um, born and raised in Washington, D.C., but now I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I make a live. I've been making a living now for about 40 or 50 years selling my artwork, I make primarily portraits. I primarily do oil portraits, and I do portrait drawings on occasion, and I used to do pastels, um, and I do other paintings, too. I've illustrated for children's books, for uh, portraits, uh, for um, Scholastic Incorporated in, in Manhattan. Oh. And um, so for many years, I lived in Washington, D.C. until 1999. And um, now for about 24 years, I've been living here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Okay. So how did you end up being a person who is able to live off of his portrait commissions? How did that happen? Um, that's what I was wondering when I was in my 20s, how I was <laughs> going to do it. <clears throat> when I got out of, I went to a small liberal arts college and then I went to uh, George Washington University in DC. But anyway, I got, I remember getting out of college and getting very depressed, thinking, how am I going to make a living mm -hmm. off a of painting? I got a job in a commercial art studio in Washington, DC. And, um, Got that job maybe when I was 18, I think, in the, in, this, in the summer. And the artist in the commercial art studio was saying, wait a minute, you think you can make a living off of your paintings? You know mm -hmm. how few people do that? And my confidence was just chiseled down to nothing. And I got out of college with a Bachelor of Fine Arts. What are you going to do with that? And I um, actually got very depressed, wondering how I was going to make it. And it was actually, it's interesting how events seem to gather around our desires and lead us step, to step by step to um, help us find our way in life. I've always been amazed with that because I had no confidence. <clears throat> but I first got a job. Uh, there was a neighbor who worked at the National Collection of Fine Arts in downtown D.C., and that, that museum has a different name now. I think it's called the Smithsonian Museum of Art, but it's shared with the um, National Portrait Gallery down in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And I got a job teaching inner kids, inner city kids drawing at, this, at, the, at the National Collection of Fine Arts. And um, I enjoyed doing that, teaching. Um, and uh, eventually... I thought I would apply for a, um, see if I could get a, I thought, well, I need more training. So I um, applied to George Washington University. I thought I took my portfolio in there and thought, I wonder if I could get a scholarship or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was able to get a fellowship um, oh, okay. to um, study there. And I studied under quite a few artists there. Um, but the main artist that I studied with, um, Bill Woodward, William Woodward, had a profound effect on, on me and my art career. In undergraduate school, um, we were just handed paint. This was <clears throat> 1970. We were handed paint and brushes. 
and just told them, you know, figure it out yourself. Uh, just <laughs> we don't want to in, we don't want to uh, interfere with the creative your, your own creative process. Right. But can you imagine handing somebody, let's say, who wanted to be a violinist? Can you imagine handing somebody a violin <laughs> and a bow and say, just saw away on it for a while? And you'll, you'll figure, figure it out. out. You'll figure it yeah. out. <laughs> and uh, throw out five hundred years of tradition, five hundred years of what other musicians have learned. And in my case, what other artists have learned, just reinvent the wheel. So undergraduate, I feel like I almost learned nothing. Mm. And, but Bill Woodward, Frank Wright was another artist, uh, um, professor there at George Washington University. And my eyes were open. They had so much knowledge to share with me. And so I, I ended up getting a, a master's of fine arts from mm. GW which you know, really isn't necessary for any art, aspiring artist. If you can just get the right instruction nowadays, of course, you can get it online, watching many videos or take uh, workshops from other artists. Another artist that had a profound effect on my career was uh, Daniel Green, who sadly passed away within the last few years. Oh, I took awesome. two workshops from Daniel Green, one in Northern Virginia, he gave one in Northern Virginia and the other in Baltimore. He was, um, his home though was in, um, I think it's New Salem, Connecticut. I never actually visited him there. But I took two workshops from him and learned so much about portrait painting. <clears throat> He's a wonderful, he was a wonderful oral painter and uh, pastel artist. And so now I felt like I had some skills and um, had some idea of what I was doing. And, um, so I approached Portraits Incorporated in New York City. Uh, another uh, portrait representative was Portrait Representatives out of Baltimore, and then Portrait South, which was um, its home office was in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, handled it south. And they started to get me commissions. Mm -hmm. And they had a portfolio. They had um, photographs, 8 by 10 inch photographs of my work. And people interested in portrait painting would approach them and um, either go to their gallery in Raleigh or meet with a portrait representative, um, those who worked with Portrait South or Portraits Incorporated, look at portfolios, pictures of my work. And if they liked my work, they would, they would uh, Portrait Inc. or Portrait South would or portrait representatives, they would con they would connect the prospective um, portrait subject with me, and we would start working together to create uh, portraits. And I found out it found it to be a uh, decent way to make a living. Okay. And I think I did. I mentioned to you, I also illustrated four children's books for portraits and uh, for for uh, Scholastic Incorporated, and. Um, in that case, I thought, wow, if I get some, it would be nice to illustrate some children's books, use my mind, use my, um, use my imagination much more than in portraits and so forth, and then live off the royalties, you know, illustrate a few children's books and then live off the royalties for the rest of my life. And I had a ball doing the um, children's books, um, but... Um, they, the royalties died out after a few years. When they, most children's books uh, um, die out after a few years. And um, mm, that's okay. what, that was what the case was. I did pretty well. I sold 100,000 copies of uh, The Rocking Horse Christmas that I illustrated by um, Mary Pope Osborne, who has a great reputation. Uh, the first book I illustrated was called The Matzah That Papa Brought Home. It's on the mm. Jewish celebration of Passover. Mm -hmm. And um, that being a smaller market, did pretty well, won some awards and so forth. And I did two other books, one by uh, Audrey Wood, who's a very uh, a uh, children's book illustrator with a good reputation. So that was a lot of fun, but you have to do like 17. I did it the old fashioned way, oil paintings. I did like 17 oil paintings for each book. Oh, wow. Okay. And, um, That's a lot. So it was, yeah, it was quite a chore. And, um, but it was a lot of fun and it's nice having the books and um, 
for a while, I would tour schools and, in a sense, be a rock star at <laughs> elementary schools for the kids, uh, yeah, yeah. talking about illustrating children's books and so forth. And a um, little interesting story on the first book, The Matzo That Papa Brought Home. That was my first children's book. And I, when I got a few illustrations into it, I realized, my God, I'm really um, biting off a lot doing 17 oil paintings. And um, I was having a hard time with this particular illustration uh, of the family selling, uh, uh, singing the Dayenu, a song that they sing during the celebration. And I remember mumbling to my wife saying, my God, what have I gotten myself into? I'm really having a hard time with this. Yeah. Uh, and she said, listen, you signed a contract. Get this done. <laughs> and that particular illustration that I had such a hard time with um, Scholastic decided to have it on the cover oh. of the book. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. And um, I got a phone call after the book was published. I got a phone call from Manischewitz Wine. They produce um, wine uh, for Passover. And they said, can we pay you a certain, uh, certain number of thousand dollars a year to lease that image from you? Uh, and so the reason, yeah, it was nice. So anyway, the point of that is, and I would tell the kids in the elementary schools, is don't give up. Sometimes right. when you're having the hardest time, when you're not able to get a particular um, painting right, or and this could apply to business or music or whatever, yeah. don't assume that that won't lead to something good and try to persevere. Mm. And that was a lesson. And so I persevered through four children's books. And had a lot of fun with them. Afterward, I would sell the illustration. I would have a show at a gallery of the illustrations and sell a lot of them. So I've been able to cobble together a living off of portrait painting, children's books, and other paintings, still lifes and figurative paintings that I've done over the years. Okay. So I've been able to make it work. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's a, that's a great adventure. And uh, like... Um... I don't know, just the way you ended up putting it together, I guess, and kind of making it happen for yourself. Um, yeah, and I'm always always amazed how just things seem to line up. I meet the right, right person, and um, first gallery I got into. I actually got a body of work together, um, figurative paintings and still lifes. And at that point, I was like, what, 21, 22. I was able to get a um, exercise fitness gym <laughs> to have the show in their lobby mm -hmm. and um the owner uh, appreciated artwork and so i had paintings hanging in there and there was a gallery owner named phil desin who had a gallery called capricorn gallery out in bethesda maryland which is right outside washington dc he came to the show and he liked the painting so much he asked me if i could join uh, his gallery he bought two of the paintings i mm. i um had in the show okay. and he represented me for years fascinating man um, um who had a gallery in bethesda one of the only galleries at that time we're talking the early 70s i'm sorry in the early uh, and, and and the 80s and into the 90s mm -hmm. one of the few galleries that had representational art at that time i see representational art today is very common and they're right they're it's great much more common from, yeah yeah, but back then, uh, it was almost kind of sneered upon. Yeah, and yeah. So there were only a few galleries, and um, um, Bert Silverman was represented by uh, Capricorn Galleries, another very good artist. And so um, it's interesting how one one thing leads to another. You might have, uh, you know, um, you might have a lead that doesn't seems very modest. You give it a try, and then that often leads to greater things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to ask you about making commissioned work versus making quote unquote personal work. Um, and uh, all right, let me, let me think a second. I have a quite, a, quite a bit to say about that. Yeah. 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 It's just that, I mean, I wonder, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you do, but especially with all the experience that you have on the subject, um, do you, do you feel like, uh, all right, I have several questions, okay? Sure. Do you feel like 
one is superior to the other? I mean, what would you say are the pros and cons of each one? And uh, for example, if I mean, I guess briefly on each of the things that I'm going to ask you, because I want to ask you other things. Um, and do you think that, have you ever felt like commissioned work ever took away from the pleasure, your pleasure in making, you know, like enjoying the process of making art? Do you think Absolutely. that? Okay. Yes, tell me more about that, please. And like the other thing that I asked you just now. So um, Phil Dezen, very wise man, the owner of Capricorn Gallery, mm -hmm. he said, of course, he he didn't want me to do portraits because his gallery thrived on figurative paintings and still life. And he said, don't get too caught up in portraits because then when you, you'll avoid, you'll um, ignore your um, your more creative work. And by the way, portraits can be very, very creative. Oh, of course, yeah. But we'll talk, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but he said, no, you know, keep working on your still lives and your figure paintings. And he said, don't let portraits woo you away from doing what you want to do. And I said, Phil, that's not going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. Trust me. Um, but what he predicted did happen. Um, and I don't have any regrets. But I stopped, you know, in other words, a bird in the hand, when you get a portrait commission, you got a commission, someone's paying you, they pay you a down payment yeah. of 40 to 50% right up front. When I'm painting um, a painting that I just want to do that I think would be really exciting to do, that's uh, speculative. Who knows if anybody's ever going to buy it? Right. So when I get a commission with a deadline, I ended up favoring that. Sure. Um, and so I started neglecting my other paintings. Um, but I've enjoyed doing portraits so much. For some reason, I love painting the human face. The yeah, human the portraits face. are awesome. <laughs> um, and so I ended up really focusing on that. Now, the, the ideal situation would be if I were just to paint portraits of people who interested me. Someone you see on the street, like, oh, I'd love to paint that person do their portraits, which I try to do on occasion. Uh, with a here, here are some of the stumbling blocks to um, or drawbacks to doing commissioned portraits. When you work up, and this is kind of advice to anybody aspiring to be a portrait artist, when you're when you are designing your um, or, or coming up with a portfolio of paintings of portraits, understand that the style you develop. That's what people are going to want you to do. Mm -hmm. So you submit a portfolio of um, pictures to Portrait Inc., Portrait South. They show it to clients, people who are interested in getting portraits done. Those clients don't want you experimenting. They don't want you trying something new. They're hiring you to paint what they see in your portfolio, right? Right. So you can kind of uh, get a little bit stale. You can get a lot, a little bit fixed. Um, you can't really experiment on somebody else's money. So make sure uh, those who of you out there who may be aspiring to be a portrait painter, when you develop your portfolio, make sure that's the way you want to paint. Uh, um, and um, understand that people are going to want you to paint that way. Mm -hmm and not do too much experimenting. So you do get a little bit fixed um, and uh, expectations are placed upon you about what your paintings are gonna look like. Um, now, if I were to paint, if I were just to ask somebody, and I've done this, I've gone up to people and said, God, you, you're so beautiful, may I do a portrait of you? Or you, you know, I love your look. I can paint it however I want to paint it. Right. And I can experiment and have a lot of fun. And um, so the great benefits to painting, always having some paintings going on um, that you're doing for your own pleasure, and own enjoyment. And there the creative juices have a fuller reign than, um, than portrait commissions. So there, there are some thoughts on that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and also, I mean, I guess maybe not so much with the portraits 
portrait ink type stuff where they're the ones looking for customers for you instead of somebody like approaching you on Instagram, for example. I'm just saying because it has happened to me because I on occasion have done portrait commissions. And I, I does it happen that the customer is like, hey, can you change this or can you change that or can you make them more like this or more like that? Does that happen? Through when you um, do it through portraits ink? It happens all the time. Right. So then and, in that case, um, in, in that, in that case, I mean, what are, I mean, if say, I mean, you know, so you've been doing it for all of this, all of this time, you know, constraints can be good, of course, and direction from an outside source can be good and positive and, and everything. But then it's like, I think, you know, it makes a lot of sense what you were saying that you become stale in the sense that the experimentation that occurs with each iteration of a new work of art is kind of stifled by kind of having to comply or having to fulfill rather the work that you have committed to, you know, because the person yeah. is paying you, they're expecting something. So yeah. What do you think about that? Now, by the way, one thing that has surprised me is how easy people have been to work with mm. and how few changes they actually act ask for. Okay. I've been pleasantly surprised. Um, so they trust me to a certain degree that what my work is, what I've done um, is to the best of my ability. But so, uh, sometimes, you know, people will say, hey, can you tighten up here a little bit? I could, <laughs> yeah. use, a little, I could use that a little myself. <laughs> or tighten up under the eye, you know, <laughs> things like that. But I've always been surprised how little they ask. And I've also been surprised when somebody has said, I'm, you're making me look too young. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I've always been surprised about that. Um, and uh, so people, you know, usually people do, men and women, by the way, both okay. men and women. I have not found women to be more vain than men. Okay. Um, definitely not. Um, and everybody, I've always been amazed how wonderful people have been. Okay. And, uh, but, you know, often they'll ask, um, uh, you know, uh, so, and by the way, sometimes they ask me to do things and I go like, oh my gosh, they're right. Yes, hmm. I have off here, you know. So um, often they'll give me, a, sometimes they'll give me a little bit of a list of things to do. And I found that it's better not to argue too much with your subject. Hear what they have to say and, um, and then go, okay, yes, I'll work on those. And I work on those parts that I think um, they're right, they need touch up, they need a little adjustment. And some comments they make, I may think, mm, I don't think there's much um, validity in that and I really, uh, I really don't wanna do that. So I don't do those, okay. I don't argue with them. I don't say I'm not gonna do that, why do you want? And I just don't do them and instead of getting in a big eye and just see what they say. Right. And I'm amazed how often they never bring them up again. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because you know, now that you're saying that specifically when 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 they're when the person is asking you for something in particular, it's like it's a, like a balance between what the person the person who's paying wants versus what you know works in a work of art or what yeah. you know is good yeah. in a work of art because it's like obviously you're the artist and they're not the artist. And they're hiring you to do the thing that you know how to do and how to do well and you know this type of stuff but then it, it's like it reminds me of like the complaints of some graphic designers that i know that they're you know it's there's like this stereotype of the relationship between the graphic designer and wh whomever they're designing for that they want all of these changes and stuff and the can you change this and can you change that just like over and over again um, and it's like, well, I mean, you know, I'm the designer and it's like, I, I'm the one who knows like the aesthetic type stuff and uh, these things, you know, so it's like, yeah, finding like, it, it seems like looking or looking for and finding a balance in that yeah. relationship. Um, when I was illustrating children's books, I worked with a wonderful editor at uh, Scholastic Incorporated, Diane Hess. And she would give, first of all, when you're, when you're illustrating a children's book, you have to look at it as one big concept. You don't do one illustration and say, how do you like this? Yeah, that's good. And then think, what am I gonna do for the next second illustration? You have to think of it all as one piece. So you yeah, do yeah. thumbnail sketches at first, just to talk, off, to talk over with the editor. 
By the way, this really surprised me. I thought I would be working very closely to the authors of the four books. Mm. I never spoke to them ever until after the book and we'd get together for lunch or whatever. Yeah. And I, I actually turned out to be to my advantage instead of having a um, author who's very, um, uh, very attached to his, to her. I say her because all the children's books were illustrated by women that I illustrated. Um, who's off, you know, she's very attached to her book and she might be sitting over my shoulder. I don't see it this way, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my editor was said, Ned, go, go for it. Uh, show me some um, thumbnail sketches of how you think the book should look. Mm -hmm. And so I would do, as I said, there were like 17 oil paintings done, uh, in uh, 17 illustrations done for each book. So I would do 17 thumbnail sketches. And she would look at him and say, no, I think you're going in the wrong direction. Take it this way. And then I would run with the ball and do another sketches. I didn't want to invest a lot of time into illustrations that would be rejected. So we just I just did rough sketches in uh, pencil or charcoal. And then we started getting them look right. And she would often give me a list of like, hey, can you change this, change that, change that? Thing? And I used this approach that I mentioned earlier. I would make changes on those points I thought were valid mm. and just not do <laughs> the ones that she commented that I didn't feel good about. And I noticed she would never comment on that. She would never go back, but hey, listen, I told you, can't you do this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, I saw that you then, didn't do the thing I yeah, asked. <laughs> yeah. And then I, I, I became so curious. That I, said, I said, listen, I'm so curious. I, I you know, you, you asked me if, um, to do this or that, and I never did it. And she said, "Yeah, I knew you'd never do it, so I didn't even bring <laughs> it up." And I thought that, oh, you know, that was that was cute. But um, so um, instead of getting in long, heated debate um, debates with the other person, I would just do it my way and a lot of the ways he or she thought uh, would look good. And then I see what you know. Then I see how they respond to it. Okay. Okay. All right. Well. As much as I am curious about other aspects of these things, uh, Mr. Bittinger, we have uh, other things I want to ask you about. So, of course, um, what is art in your opinion? Um, you know, when I give workshops um, in painting and so forth, I would always tell my students that I'm, you know, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm mainly going to be teaching you how to make a face look like a face, how to get the proportions right, how to get the uh, values right, that's how lighter, darker tone is, and get the color right, to make a face look like a face. We really don't, we don't have a lot of time during that time to talk about the aesthetics, which is really the art part. Getting a face or an apple, a still life, to look the way it looks is kind of a technical achievement. It's not really art, just reproducing the scene in front of you, reproducing mm -hmm. the face that's in front of you, mm -hmm. is not really art. The art is your personal interpretation of the still life that sits in front of you or the um, your subject, the person that uh, sits in front of you. It's your interpretation. We're not just um, uh, machines reproducing um, what is in front of you, we're given an interpretation. Maybe you want to exaggerate certain features. Maybe you want to exaggerate certain colors or subdue colors. Maybe you want to have a very uh, limited palette. Um, and um, so my, my feeling is art is your interpretation of the subject in front of you. How are you going to handle the brush strokes? Um, what is the composition going to be? How are you going to make um, a composition that repeats shapes. Repetition, for instance, is one of the um, primary concepts in all art. Repeating shapes, repeating um, a melody over and over again um, in music. Dun, 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 dun. You know, there's a repetition. Yeah. And repet mm -hmm. Repetition knits things together, um, but you do it in a new and fresh way. So art really is um, trying to express your feelings about a subject through the manipulation of paint. 
and um, textures and line and so forth. So art is your interpretation, um, how you're gonna make something original out of what stands in front of you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, I like a lot what you said at first. I mean, I, I like everything you said, but I particularly <laughs> like what you said at first um, about how art isn't just copying, just reproducing accurately yeah. what you're referencing. And it really made yeah. me think of hyperrealism. And I mean, I don't know how much in vogue it is this, these days, but I have a kind of like a beef with it. You know, it's it like- I do too it missed me a little bit because because there is no interpretation like you were saying it's like there's no handwriting of the artist in a hyper realistic work because you're the the, the purpose of hyper realism is to just reproduce the thing as faithfully as possible as it is in reality and it's like um i've heard of the process of like taking a photograph of the scene that you're going to paint in a hyper realistic way you take the photograph and then they take the photograph of different sections like up close to then have even more close up to more detail to put into the hyper realistic image. And it's like, first of all, you have all of these pictures. It's like the picture already did what the goal of your painting is gonna be. So it's like, you know, I- That's the point. Yeah, so like, I mean, it is the point. And I think in that case, it is pointless because the camera already did. And I think the point of the analog media that we love so very much is precisely that it does things that the camera cannot do, you know, um, because in- I'm sorry, in the, you say the, the analog media? You know, like drawing, yeah. painting. I'm an, I'm an old guy with the- <laughs> No, I don't, I don't you know. <laughs> what is analog media? Uh, you know, the traditional media, like drawing uh, graphite, charcoal, oil. Oh, okay, I see, as opposed to digital. As okay. opposed to yeah, digital, yeah, including including the camera, so. So, um, yeah, I mean, I just really enjoy that point. And I also really enjoyed the point that you said about uh, rhythm being present. I mean, uh, the repetition being present in the imagery that, you know, we see and then that we want to interpret in, in um, the paper or, or the canvas, and then kind of interpreting that rhythm that we see in nature, you know, whether it's a, the human figure or a landscape in our image. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. What do you What do you What do you think about this? Um, well, here you know. Um, what, I'd like to talk about some, and if with your permission, of course. Um, uh, at some point, I want to talk about why am I painting? Why does anyone paint? Why? Oh yeah, please tell me. Yeah. Your, please everyone tell me your thoughts be, on that. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone should be clear what their intentions are. What now for a lot of people. Uh, and me included, um, very often, especially when we're starting off, we want to please others. We want somebody to pat you on, you know, I, I wanted people to pat me on the back like, oh, aren't you so clever? You're so yeah, clever. Yeah. <laughs> and then they, uh, often they'll say, oh, it looks just like a photograph. Right. Now, this is the big stumbling block because so many artists start to develop this idea like, oh, you mean a painting can't be any better than a photograph or, or, or your goal should be to reproduce something so it looks like a photograph. Well, then I'm going to grid off. I'm going to take a photograph and grid it off and try to re reproduce every square. Um, that's not art. Mm. That's a mechanical process that you know you might just be clear what you're doing. Just be clear. You know, it's not art. You might enjoy doing that. Okay, fine. But don't claim that it's um, uh, you know you're creating a piece of art just by reproducing bit by bit. By the way, I don't even know, you know, I'm an old guy, I'm 72. Um, I don't project. Um, uh, yeah. I either work from a model or I I do have an, a, a monitor. You can see my monitor in the background there. Okay. That's some paintings back there. And so I do take, when I meet with a subject, uh, no subject's gonna pose for me anymore the whole time. So I meet with them, I take photographs, try to get a good composition, get the lighting, like lighting and composition uh, are so important in doing a portrait, right? And so that's part of the creative process. I know some artists, they'll hire a photograph photographer to go take the pictures. Mm. Um, but but the pose and the lighting, that's, that's, that's like your statement. That's like the creative process. And so I don't 
and I don't project on my canvas. I do it the old fashioned way. I mean, I do have a monitor. The monitor is next to my, the monitor is next to the, my port, the monitor here is next to the painting I'm working on. So I'm working from the picture on the monitor, but I'm still kind of doing the drawing from what I'm seeing on the monitor and not projecting. Um, but anyway, um, um, when I when I spoke about what are we doing it for, I found out that, by the way, my paintings, in my opinion, are too slavishly faithful to what I'm painting. I'm not mm. doing enough expressing myself the way I want to uh, trying something original. So the criticism I'm um, leveling at others, perhaps, I find, find gu I'm guilty of too. Mm. I'm too faithful to the original image that I'm working from um, and not interpreting it enough. Um, but what are we working? What are we doing? Are we trying? So often I think when I'm painting, is it the is it the praise that I'm going to get from others? Like, oh, Ned, you're so clever. Look, that's so good. It looks just like a photograph. Is that is that a, a legitimate reason for my painting? Um, um, so what is the right reason to be painting, by the way? And this applies to both professional and am I'll call them amateur painters, people who want to paint. My feeling is the ultimate goal of painting, the number one goal of painting is to have fun, mm. to enjoy yourself. Whatever feelings of joy and excitement and interest and absorption you're having when you're painting or doing any kind of artwork, that's being captured in the pigment, in the marble, in the wood, um, in the tapestry, in the rug you're weaving, whatever. The joy, the excitement, the absorption you're feeling um, when time disappears. This is something, you know, all, I think all artists notice that when they're doing artwork, time disappears. You enter another dimension, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, which can be annoying to other people who are expecting you to be on time to a meeting or something or to <laughs> dinner. Right. You get lost. You get lost in your, in your painting or whatever you're doing. But the main thing is to have fun. If I'm not having fun, I think, okay, I got to change this. What am, it usually means I'm working in a way that's stale, nothing um, creative or original about it. Um, and in order to break the lack of enjoyment, I know I have to shake things up and do something um, new and fresh. So my, my feeling is the most important thing is for you to have fun and enjoyment and enjoy yourselves. And that can be for the Sunday painter. Um, uh, I'm envious of people who can just paint whatever the heck they want to paint and don't have to work on commissions. But I got I to gotta hustle. I got to keep commissions coming in, pay the bills that way. But um, those who just paint on Sunday or Saturday, um, they're in an enviable position because they can do whatever they want to do and keep it fresh and original. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you... How do you, I guess, you know, back to your, because of what you're saying about having your reason for making work and that you, one should have fun when making, when uh, searching for something in a work of art. Um, how do you separate, I guess, the work that you make, like the hired work, like the hired paintings that you make from that, it's like, you know, how do you keep making the commissioned work without kind of losing the charm that you feel for painting. Yeah, okay, so I mentioned earlier to you that people hire me because of the particular style that I have, the particular look, okay? Mm -hmm. So I can't deviate too much from that. But where I can deviate is on the composition, where I can be very creative is in the composition and the lighting. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you're familiar with the Portrait Society of America. I they know. have, um, you know, they have uh, con competitions. Right. And I, I think I've won about four of their oh, awards. Oh, nice. But anyway, uh, and last um, December, um, they, they sponsor, by the way, in the fall, they sponsor a uh, commissioned portrait competition. And um, I won first place, by the way. Nice. Out of, you know, out of 1,165 entries, I got first place. I was, I was surprised, actually. But anyway, that was a portrait of a commission of a judge. 
And how did I make a judge portrait painted in my usual style? Look kind of interesting. And it was the composition. It was the composition and the lighting. When I show up at a um, photo session, and this was Judge uh, Catliota in uh, Baltimore. When I showed up, um, here, here are a few, few ideas. Uh, when I show up, often I try to coax a good pose out of people. Mm -hmm. Some people are natural posers. They, they'll fall into these great poses without any, uh, any problem. Other people can be very stiff. You say, would you put your hand um, on, would you put your hand on the chair? And they'll, you know, they'll put their hand like this, you know. And, yeah, yeah. And but you you never criticize or this and that. You have to try to very carefully coax them. So sure. suddenly I'll ask them like, um, "What did you do last weekend?" Or, or wait, what? I see on your desk there. You you're in the baseball or something. I try to get their mind off of posing. Mm -hmm. That oh, I'm posing now for this artist. <laughs> uh, the, uh, and then they get all stiff. Um, or I'll say, "Let's just take a break, relax." And then people fall naturally into poses that are wonderful. And uh, so with Judge Catliota, I was not very happy with any of the pictures we were taking. And I said, oh, just take a break. Let's sit down and just talk. And he fell into this wonderful pose. I think his hand was up like this. Or something. And, and the lighting was just the room lighting. And then I suddenly said, freeze, freeze, freeze. And I took some pictures. Um, and it turned out that the so often the poses that people fall into naturally have the most originality to them, have the most potential, and often using just the natural light filtering into the room from outside or, or, or the lights overhead, um, the best and more original compositions come, can come about. So what I find is by just watching the people, engaging them in conversation, and just seeing what pose they fall into often bring, um, brings forth more original compositions than anything else. I've done uh, a couple of uh, secretaries of state that hang in the U.S. State Department in D.C. Mm, By the nice. way, I got two, I got two paintings uh, hanging in the U.S. Capitol, actually. Um, nice. And two uh, secretaries of energy I've painted and two in the Pentagon. But anyway, I met with uh, Lawrence Eagleburger in his home in uh, Charlotte, Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, he was a secretary of state. This was like 20, 30 years ago. He was a secretary of state. And while I was setting up all my equipment, I was watching him. And he stood in this doorway with his arm up like this. I think it was the other arm like this, like waiting, like, when's this guy going to hurry up and get his equipment set up? <laughs> yeah. And he was standing there, and I said, hold, hold that for a second. And we took a few pictures. And I must have spent three hours walking around his house, taking pictures of him here and there, getting him to pose like this and that. Um, but, <clears throat> but at the end of the day, when we were reviewing the pictures, he and his wife said, the picture of him at the beginning when he was yeah. leaning in the doorway he said that's him all these other things look posed that was him and that portrait of him in the uh, state department the curator there once told me that that gets the most comments hmm. um because it kind of was an original uh, pose so one thing you can always be original about no matter even if your stuff your style is kind of um fixed you can always come up with a new, fresh, original pose and original lighting. Mm -hmm. so that was a long answer to your question. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, it, that makes a lot of sense as kind of like a point of compromise in finding finding like the charm, I guess, like uh, the word that I used a second ago, in making portrait, you know, commissioned work. Yeah, because because that you know if you're the one that uh, is out take is uh, taking the photographs and if if you know if, if you're able to find like this natural pose on the subject, then that that's sure to make you more excited about. Yeah, uh, you know, like My finding best. it. Yeah, finding it and then painting that. And but you know, on the other side, there have been times when I have coached someone into a pose. Like, hey, what would happen if you put your hand up here? Yeah. And, 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 and some of those have turned out really good. So when I show up for a uh, photo shoot um, for a picture, 
that I'm going to work from. I try not to have too many preconceived expectations. I try to right. work with the surroundings. Um, I, I just watch the person when they're not being, when they don't think they're being posed. I'm waiting for them to fall in the perfect um, pose and um, and just work with the situation, look around and I say, hey, how about if you stood in front of this sculpture you have over here in the corner? Things like that. <laughs> and um, it, all, it, it, it always seems to work out. I'm, okay. I'm delighted to say that so far, I've never had a portrait completely refused. There have been portraits where um, they weren't real happy. I once did a portrait of a man. Do you, do you mind me rambling on? Like uh, no, that? I want to hear the story. <laughs> okay, so I was doing a portrait of a Texan, but it was it was a posthumous portrait. In other words, a portrait done of someone who had already oh, died. Oh, you didn't have the guy, okay. Yeah, and so his um, um, his widow supplied me with a photo for me to work from. He was outside. He's got a big 10-gallon Texan hat on his hip. I did the painting. I thought as good as I could do it. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, she, she wrote me a scathing letter saying it didn't look like him. Everybody at the office said it didn't look like him. And on and on and on. And... Um, I looked at the painting and I thought, you know what? I thought I really matched it well. I got, got a good likeness. Um, and I was in a quandary knowing what to do, but I didn't want to let, let on that I didn't know what to do. Yeah, I yeah, called yeah. Her, so I called her up. I said, listen, we're going to get this right. Even if I got to drag my canvas down to Dallas, I mean, and you stand behind me, we're going to get the painting right. Yeah. I want to assure you, even though I had no idea how I was going to do it. And I would study it. And I went over it very carefully. And I said, but before I uh, drag the painting down to Dallas and have you stand behind me, let me have another shot at it. And so I really examined it. And I said, oh, I can change this. And I really went over it with a fine tooth comb and got it as, and then I thought, you know, I, 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 I have found ways to make it better. And um, I sent pictures to her this time, and she loved it, loved it. Mm -hmm. uh, so my point is here, even if you have no idea, don't let on to the uh, your yeah, yeah, yeah. client that um, you're doubtful, you have no idea how you're going to. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good tip. It. Yeah, um, pretend to be confident. Okay. And, um, and, that, and that even pretending to be confident rubs off on your on yourself and you'll figure out a way to to resolve okay. it okay that's that's a really good tip all right so mr bittinger what is what is beauty in your opinion it's certainly not me <laughs> but uh, no I, I, let's see beauty you know that's i you know what's something that's always fascinated me is that we seem to have this ingrained innate appreciation for beauty in many regards that spans all cultures mm -hmm. um for instance i've always been amazed there's the there's a sculpture a bust found in an ancient egyptian tomb of who is it nefertiti or nefertiri yep. um we've all seen it and you know i look at that and go like wow that is just a drop dead gorgeous woman yeah and uh you think, well, wouldn't you think they would have a totally different idea what beauty is and so forth? Um, um, but um, we seem to have this innate sense of the perfect symmetry, perfect features, um, where we can all go like, wow, that person is beautiful, or that landscape. We're all moved. I don't think there's anybody who's not moved by a sunset. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Why do we seem to have we are in agreement in many ways of what beauty is. And, you know, I don't know if I can put it in words. I don't think I can analyze why one woman is considered beautiful. One man is considered very handsome and another is not. But we seem to all agree on it to some degree. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, although there are fluctuations, uh, you know, the, sure. the I, what we considered a beautiful woman in the 50s. And what her, the standards we had was were very limited compared to what we have today. So it does it does vary in certain 
degrees. It's kind of, it's kind of it's uh, perplexing to me how beauty the standards of beauty actually shift and don't shift at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, all I know, all I know about beauty is when I see it, I'm very moved and I recognize it. Like, wow, that is that's beautiful. Look at that landscape. Look at that mm -hmm. particular still life. Um, but it's hard for me to analyze why I have that response and why other people agree with me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, why do we find the uh, sunset beautiful? Um, I'm very moved by sunsets out here in New Mexico and uh, and everybody is in agreement. Like, oh, yeah, that's just so beautiful. I don't know. I, I So I don't know what beauty is. So I suppose I have to say, in a way, I don't know what beauty is, but I recognize it when I see it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. The... Sorry, I couldn't give a, a no. sorry I couldn't give you a clear definition <laughs> of what beauty is. <laughs> no, no, no problem at all. I actually quite enjoyed the uh, what you said about it being cross cultural and how we, you know, humans, we agree on the what we consider to be beautiful, even though even though there's little variations and you know tastes for it here and there yeah, yeah. it's really refreshing because um more often than more often than not um you know it's very common for people to say beauty is an ab beholder and nobody is going to think yeah. that the same thing is uh everybody's idea of beauty is different which is kind of like what you were saying but at the same time i completely agree with the idea with what you are saying that there's definitely something about whatever it is about, you know, the Nefertiti, about the sunset, about, you know, a, a tree, you know, a solemn... Greek sculpture, you know? Yeah, Greek sculpture. What they, what they thought of as a beautiful human man and what they thought of as a beautiful woman, we still go like, oh my God, that, that's beautiful. Yeah, as absolutely. If they, as, if they, as if their standards were exactly the same as ours. It's, it's kind yeah, of yeah. surprising, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, what, what would you say that you feel? What would you say you're feeling? So like, so like when, even if you don't, you can't, even if you don't quite know what beauty is, what do you think, what is it that you're feeling when you're gazing upon it? Oh, I mean, I'll, um, I've always been, uh, um, ever since I was a child, I've always been um, bowled over by like beautiful women beautiful girls <laughs> mm -hmm. i mean i got i got I, 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 I remember having crushes even in kindergarten but for instance like a beautiful woman i'm just like not you know even at 72 i thought i'd outgrow this or something but mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i'm just struck um speechless in front of uh uh i was at a restaurant just the other day and the the, the hostess so i said where, where are you from she said it was kazakhstan and i said and she was just, just absolutely beautiful um, from a different culture, different. And um, so, so beauty just um, makes, knocks me into awe. I think that's one of the reasons I love doing portraits. I love, when I'm painting, by the way, it's interesting, when I'm painting somebody, they look beautiful to me. Mm -hmm. I just marvel at the shape of our, like the human eyes and the nose. And the, but for some reason, when I'm painting, my appreciation um, is greatly increased, no matter how objectively one might judge that the person uh, as being beautiful during according to certain standards. Everybody, when I'm painting them, when, no matter who I, when I'm painting them, they just look beautiful to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, yeah. The I shape think... of our nose, the lips, you know, the you know, Cupid bow, you know, the the. the um, the curls, the, ri the rising arches and the lips are so beautiful, the shape. They look like a bow, right? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, yeah. Um, I think in some, I, I'm trying to remember in what, what, what language they call uh, lips the Cupid, Cupid's bow or something like that. But the, um, the shape and eyes, the shape of eyes and the eyelashes and eyebrows. It's, uh, you know, I'm, I, so the, my response to beauty is awe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you're singing to the choir about yeah, 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 yeah. Appreciate... You're singing to the choir about um, enjoying the appearance of the person that you're drawing, whether you're drawing them from a photograph or from life. Because you have that too, right? You have that. Too. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And, and uh, I mean, I would say that I, I mean, maybe for you as well, it's like, if you're drawing the person from life, it is like that, what you're talking about, the amazement at the figure is kind of super, yeah. super jacked up. Um, yes. And yes. it's like, and it's like just, you know, like the little fidgeting and like, like I, I get really impressed when the model, you know, if I'm drawing a model and the model like takes a deep breath and like you see the ribs doing that thing, you know, when you're breathing yes. and that's yeah. just amazing. And I think, you know, uh, who's, uh, a previous guest said that um, something about how when we make art, it's nature because we are nature of nature, you know, because nature made yeah. us, yes, um, yeah. it's nature appreciating itself. I love that. Yes. And it's, oh, I, I think it's actually, it was actually the previous guest, which is uh, Carolyn Edlund from um, Artsy Shark. And, and um, I, you know, I think it's consonant with what you're, with this, what you experience when you're looking at your subject in order to paint them, because it's like really, you know, it's, it, it's kind of infinite. Like you were saying just now, if you're looking at a person, like at the portrait, it's like, this whole this whole thing like you know the socket becomes like zygomatic and like this stuff happening around the mouth and but you know it's not flat because you know the mouth becomes something else and you know it becomes another tissue and you know it's infinite in that it just keeps it's deeper and deeper because you can keep looking at it and just being amazed by it you know yes you know you know one, one thing i really appreciate too um that maybe some of the listeners do or would, would appreciate doing is watching people's gestures when they mm. talk. Have you ever have you ever looked way across um, an open space, a plaza or something, and you see somebody on their cell phone, and they're, and they're just, you can't hear, you're not distracted by what they're saying, right? You can just watch um, all the gestures, and it's almost like uh, ballet and uh, yeah. all the movements they're making, and you're, you're, because you can't hear what they're saying. You're not distracted by that. And sometimes I just love watching people talk, the expressions, the the vulnerability flitting across their faces or confusion or laughter, all the different emotions that dance across our faces and our body language. It's fun yes. to just watch people and watch, forget about what they're saying and just mm -hmm. watch their gestures and so forth. Yes, yes, I agree with that. Okay, I think that's a really... Great last thought, uh, Mr. Bininger, because we have reached the 55 minute mark of our conversation. Um, is there anything that you would like to add, um, you know, here at the end? Uh, what are you working on? Is there anything you're excited about? Where can people find your work? Oh, sure. Well, right now I'm working on a um, portrait of the, um, the dean, I mean, the uh, chairman of the board of trustees for NYU, New York University. Huh. Okay. And that's been a, a great, um, we're getting near the end. Um, his wife wants me to do a little touch up on the mouth. Uh -huh. I don't have the mouth quite right, but that's what I'm working <laughs> on now. And um, um, been working on some children's portraits. And um, I got a dean for the uh, School of Engineering at NC State University. I'll be starting right away. But um Again, I, I want to emphasize for the, you know, not everybody out there who's lit watching this, I assume, is, is a professional artist or wants to be a professional artist. But I highly encourage people to give painting a try because it's so, it can be so satisfying. Um, or at least pick up something, have some skill, some creative endeavor that you want to devote yourself to. It enriches your life. Too many yes. people glued to the TV and, and uh, watching other people's creative um, endeavors on. Um, but it's good to have, it could be knitting, it could be painting, it could be music, take up a musical instrument, uh, it could be weaving, um, woodwork, auto mechanics, whatever. But I encourage people, it, it'll enrich your life so much if you take up some creative um, endeavor and work on it over a lifetime. That's lovely. All right. All right. It's been so, a pleasure. Yeah, no, um, same. Uh, Ned, thank you everyone for watching and listening. A special thanks to my guest, Ned, for agreeing to talk to me and for his time. 
If you'd like to support Ned, my podcast, myself, or all three, all corresponding links will be in the caption. Make sure you like this video and leave a comment so we know you were with us. Also remember to subscribe to my audiovisual channel and thank you everyone and see you next time. Bye. Bye everyone.